Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Yeah, awesome. Let's take our Bibles. Let's go to the Old Testament, the book of Ruth. While you're flipping there, we'll be in Ruth chapter 3 this morning. Thank you for, uh, for praying for, uh, for me this week. Um, I, was at, uh, I was down in First Baptist Olo last uh, Sunday. Hope you had a good fourth. And then this week, I was down in Foley, Alabama, and uh, just show you how the reason why we let you know, and, and if you're ever in a ministry situation, you let us know, because we're all working together for the kingdom of God. Uh, Thursday night after the service, uh, I had a, a high school student come to me broken over their sin and said, I need Jesus, and was able to share that. And that's because we preach the gospel, and that's because you pray. So there's, uh, there's new people in the kingdom of God this week, and I just want to share that with you, you know, as, a, as encouragement. When, uh, whenever someone from our church family goes out and shares or, or does anything, we all share in that reward as we pray and love and share. So praise God for that. Um, as you're going to Ruth chapter 3, we got an opportunity this morning. We need to pray for Justin's father. Justin's on his way back um, from the Laurel Hospital right now. His dad uh, fell and uh, was in the ER last night, and he's in the ICU this morning. Uh, and so we're going to stop the service right now. We're going to pray for his dad, Tommy Holofield. So we're going to pray for Justin's dad. And uh, so let's do this. Um, let, let's, let's pray um, for the immediate physical needs. And uh, let's pray for, for Justin and, and Ashley. Um, let's pray for Justin's sister. Let's just pray for that entire family. And, uh, you know, he, he'll be here at the end. And, and uh, if you want to love on him, do it. Uh, so he, he's, they had a visitation time at 10 this morning. So he's spending a few moments with his father, and he's going to come back and join us for worship. And I told him this morning, um, we, were, we were talking in, in my office, and we were we were praying, and I just said, hey, man, it's okay. You know, it's okay for people to love on you. It's okay for, and, and if you, you know, if you show a little emotion, man, that's okay. We're, we're men too. And so let's love on him today, but let's love on him specifically right now, and let's love on his father. Let's go to them on the behalf of the father of all. So we're going to be quiet for just a minute. I want you to intercede, and then, and then I'll pray for us, okay? So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's pray for Mr. Tommy Holfield, for Justin and his family. You pray, and then I'll lead us. Father, we thank you that the scripture says in your presence there is fullness of joy. Lord, it also says that we're supposed to cast our cares on you because you care for us. Lord, the scripture says that you uphold the righteous. The scripture says that the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So Lord, as, uh, as your church this morning, we lift up Mr. Tommy Holfield. God, we pray for all of his physical problems and issues right now. We pray for doctors and nurses that are caring for him. And Lord, we pray that you'll do a work in his life. Father, we pray though for Justin. God, we pray for your peace to overcome him, for your strength to sustain him. Lord, we pray that you would uphold him as you say you do in the scripture. Lord, thank you for Ashley. Thank you for her ministry to Justin as his wife. God, we pray for, uh, for Justin's sister. Lord, we pray for that entire family. This morning, we can't give him specifically, Lord, we can't ultimately meet what needs to happen in this situation, but God, you can, and we submit it to you. And Lord, there's probably other people in this room that are going through similar things. And Father, we lift those and bring those at your feet. We don't know all the, the situations and the difficulties but God, you're sufficient and you're sovereign and you're kind and you're good as we've been learning in Ruth. So Father, we, we ask for you to work all things to the, the purpose of your gracious will that Christ may be glorified. Lord, as we turn our attention to the scripture this morning, teach us, open our eyes to see wondrous things from your law. Help us to see truth. Help us to see how you were faithful to this family and faithful to a nation and ultimately faithful to the world that had rejected you because you Gave us this story, Ruth, to show you how you were ultimately going to send a Savior. So this morning, even in the Scripture, help us see Christ. And we ask it with the help of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Ruth chapter 3 will be here the next two weeks. I will uh, give you an overview, and then Justin will come back 
um, as we've kind of, to keep the Ruth theme, he'll gather up the, uh, the leftover grain in the field. But Ruth chapter three, we're gonna read the whole chapter if you would permit me to do that again. And, uh, and then Justin will come back and, and teach through it uh, next week. Ruth chapter three, now remember where we are in this book. We're at halftime, that's where we were last week. We were in chapter one for three weeks, we were in chapter two for two weeks, and now we pause, and if you would just go back to verse 23, the last verse of chapter two, you will see the context. So she, that's Ruth, kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and the wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. So Ruth has, as Justin taught us last week, has found favor. You remember the three times favor was found in chapter two. Ruth says, I'm gonna go out and hope I find favor. And then Boaz shows her favor. And then we find her saying, can I please stay in this favor, this kindness, this kessid, the Hebrew says, this covenantal faithful kindness that you've shown me. And when we get to the end of chapter two, what we find is, is that Naomi and Ruth settle in to this pattern of life between the barley and the wheat harvest. And we, we learn that that's from the time frame of Passover to Pentecost, which has huge ramifications when we think about it from a global scale, from a, a, a biblical worldview scale. But in the time frame of this, this is mid-April to early to mid-June. This is six or seven weeks. So we find them the daily routine, Ruth gets up, she goes out, she works the field, she takes uh, Boaz at his word and at his kindness. Not only is she glee, gleaning up what's left occasionally, they will just throw extra stalks in the field so that this young Moabitess can be fed. And she'll gather it up, she'll take it home. Naomi will teach her how to cook Israelite style. And this is how they have settled in their everyday life. Let's read it, Ruth chapter three, Verses 1 through 18. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, that's Ruth, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, and that you have not gone after young. This is not a command. Uh, college student, okay? This is not a command, young single adult, okay? You're not supposed to go down to the threshing floor and uncover somebody's feet and when they wake up say, hey, you're mine. Like, don't, you don't have to do that, okay? We're gonna contextualize this passage. The second part of the story we see is that Ruth, this is so crazy, y'all. She, what she's doing is she proposes to Boaz. Naomi sends her down there. Boaz isn't obviously making any moves, so we're gonna force his hand. So she goes down there and she does exactly what Naomi tells her to do. She, verse seven, she comes softly, she uncovers his feet, she lays down. So probably what was happening was she uncovered probably the bottom part of his leg again. So then in the, the, the night, in the midnight, he would wake up rather cold and she was laying at the end. Now it says here that he was startled and probably what that is, he had a chill, he had a night chill. And so he turns over, or he's startled and all of a sudden the Hebrew goes, Hane, Asha, which is like, behold, a woman. So he's like, I'm at a threshing floor. I'm hanging out with dudes. We've worked all day. Why is there a woman here? That's the way that I can comprehend this. My, my grandfather, whose name was Howard Johnson, not the hotel dude, he was a realtor. He, he got saved out of a, a life of sin and he loved Jesus. And like 40 years later, he got Alzheimer's. And one night he was in bed asleep and my grandmother was lying next to him. And he woke up and he was startled because there was a woman lying next to him. He went, woman, where is your husband? 
My grandmother said, I didn't know whether to cry or laugh, but that, that's the thought here. And what was amazing was my, my grandfather, such a man of integrity, even in his Alzheimer's, he's like, I'm in a bad situation. How did I get here? You know, that's what's going on. And so Boaz, the furthest thing in his mind, he's thinking like, why would a woman be here? Like, no. And so he wakes up and he says, who are you? I'm Ruth. And then she says, spread your wings over your servant. This was an ancient statement basically saying, cover me, protect me, I'm taking refuge in you. And this was a symbolic act. This would be that a man would pledge himself to this woman and a woman would pledge himself to the man. So, so notice here, this was not part of the game plan. Naomi did not say, when you get down there, he'll tell you what to, she said, he'll tell you what to do. She didn't say, drop the question on him. She didn't, she didn't say that. Ruth, Ruth changes it. She she, she, in a sense, goes beyond what's asked, and she says, hey, you need to marry me. That's what's going on here. So she's proposing to Boaz. The third part of the story we see is that Boaz, in response, promises to redeem Ruth. Now notice, he says specifically in verse 10, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first. What's he talking about? It's the kindness that she showed Naomi. It's the kindness that she showed him by working hard in the field. And what he's saying is, I am blown away that you would do this. Why? You have not, verse 10, gone after young men, whether poor or rich. Time out, let me explain something. We introduced to you two weeks ago and last week the concept of leveret marriage. That if a man dies without having a son, and there's a younger brother that's unmarried, the younger brother shall take the widow as his wife in order so that a family doesn't die out in Israel. Now, here's the thing. In this situation, where's the brother of Malon? He's dead. And so leveret marriage really in this situation doesn't apply. Ruth was not bound to marry a brother because there was no brother. And because there wasn't a brother, she was free to marry anybody she wanted to. And so based off what the text is saying here, Boaz is, because you notice all throughout the book, he's been calling her my daughter, my daughter, my daughter. He's an older dude, y'all. He's an older bachelor. And what he's saying is, you're going to pick me? You don't have to. Look at my hair. Now, he's not like ancient because he can work all day. But he's not some young strapping buck either. You're going to pick me? You're going to show me this type of kessid, this type of kindness? But he says, we got we to stop. We got to wait because, yeah, I am a redeemer. And yes, I am a relative. But there's actually someone that's in line in front of me first. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to lay down because if I send you back out while it's still dark, I'm putting you in danger and it would totally undo all this kindness that you've shown me. So you just stay there. And when it gets dawn, you, you just ease on your way. And then when that happens, he, he gives her all this food as an offering. Like, why not a, why not a ring, right? Dylan and Dara are here this morning. I told them I was going to embarrass them. Congratulations, by the way. They just got engaged. I told Dara I dropped Dylan when he was four months old, and he's okay, so praise God. Hey, congratulations. We celebrate that. Amen. Amen. But, but you gave her a ring. You didn't give her six, six measures of barley, right? But that's what, that's what Boaz does. He gives her all this food, and then he goes back, and again, what do we have? At the end of a chapter, Naomi is stoked. My daughter He's going to deal with it today. So as we walk through this story, and I think it's so refreshing for us as people who share the word of God and hear the word of God, that that's, that's the story without westernizing it or Americanizing it. But what can we learn from this story? A few truths this morning for you to write down. Number one, by grace, there is a way forward from our mourning and grief. By grace, there is a way forward from our mourning to our grief. The first two chapters are all about these two women who have suffered crazy grief. Naomi's lost a husband. She's lost two sons. One of her daughter-in-laws has gone back to Moab. Ruth has lost 
a father-in-law, she's lost her husband, she's lost her brother-in-law. It's just mourning. We, we, we studied how they came back to Bethlehem and, and Naomi was just bitter. But even in chapter two, even when there's a ray of sunlight that who's this dude Boaz and what, how's he gonna turn out in the story? Even in the midst of hitting their stride in daily life, guess what? They're still mourning. You know what Naomi's telling Ruth to do? Wash, perfume yourself, put on new clothes. What she's saying is, my daughter, let's move on with our life. For, for Ruth, some, some commentators actually think that she was probably still wearing the, the clothing of a widow who was in mourning. And that's probably why Boaz hadn't taken, making any moves yet in the field. Hadn't gone after her or begin to approach her and begin to talk about marriage because he was trying to respect her. Shows you what type of man he was. But what's happening here is Naomi is saying, listen, it's time. We've mourned and we've mourned for a while. It's time to move on. Now, listen to me this morning. I'm not saying at all that you just need to forget your grief and move on. I'm not saying that. I'm not telling you this morning that you should just get over mourning and loss and pain. That's what I'm not saying it at all. Because in the scripture, we find people that lose loved ones. We found them in this book. We find them in all of scripture. What I am saying is that there can come a time in your life when God can take all the pain, all the loss, all the grief, and glorify himself in such a way that he says, I am enough. I walked with you through this chapter, and I will walk through you through this next chapter. And we can watch God turn our mourning into dancing. That's what Naomi's doing here. Some of us have just been living with a burden of mourning and loss and pain and grief for years. And it's different for every person how we deal with that. What I am saying is, is that by God's grace, there does come a time when we are enabled and empowered to begin to get victory over that and to see that our Savior really did defeat death, hell, and the grave. He is the resurrection and the life. If we lost someone and they were in Christ, guess what? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If we're Christians, that means we're called to believe and we're called to stake and hope all of our life upon the reality that he's victorious. He walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death and we fear no evil for he is with us and he will bring us out of the valley of the shadow of death death. Ruth, take off your mourning garments because God's got something else for you now. And where there was grief, he's about to bring joy. That's what the chapter is saying. I think another big truth for us to grab today is number two, we should always strive to do the right thing in every circumstance. Speaking about Boaz here, an A, a Shah, a woman, what is a woman doing here? Israelite men would have acted three ways in that situation. They would have taken it as an offer and they would have gone up on the offer and it would have been a one night stand and the woman would have probably then been humiliated. There would have been some in the middle where possibly the man gratified himself and took care of the woman for a little while and then it was her fault and move on or, or what we have with Boaz doing things right. I find it interesting that he knows he's second in line. And I find it really interesting that this probably middle-aged dude and this probably early 20s woman who is graceful, her name means friend, she's kind, she's hardworking, that he, everything's there for him. He's like, stop, time out, we need to do this the right way. But she's offering herself, she wants to marry me. Stop, time out, we need to do this the right way. Can I speak to this in two ways? Let me speak to those of you that are single. In relationships, there is a right way to do things and there is a wrong way to do things. There is a godly way to do things and there is an ungodly way to do things. While they had every right in the world to possibly enter into a relationship that night, they didn't because they wanted to honor God. We find ourselves in the midst of a generation that does everything that is opposed to the law of God, sexually, relationally, and you think you have the right to it. You don't. That way is destruction. When you glue the emotions of your heart to someone else 
and the body says I love you, but the heart, the mind, and the will don't, all you're going to do is end up with heartache and destruction. Let me warn you this morning from the word of God, be like Boaz. Yeah, I'm a relative. Yeah, I have a right. Yeah, I can pull this off, but we got to wait. We got to wait. We got to do this thing right. Someone one time asked me to marry them. Found out they were shacked up. So I said, man, I'll marry you, but y'all need to move out. Because I can't just stand on wedding day and do like spiritual charades and ask God to bless something when you just kind of shot him the middle finger your whole engagement. Like I can't do that. There's a way to do it. Honor God. He can redeem. If you've messed up, guess what? Our God is gracious. He can restore. He can cleanse. He can purify, but he can't do it when we're wallowing in the mud. And I love this, that I think first and foremost, Boaz is such a man of integrity because he's going to do what God says. Man, the bigger picture is we should always strive to do the right thing in every circumstance. Relationally, financially, do we bat a thousand on that? No. Should we strive to? Yes. What in my life am I not doing the right thing? It's, it's so just, it's amazing here. You don't have to super spiritualize it. You can just say, there's the right thing. I think it's in the book of James. If you know to do the right thing, you don't do it, it's sin. <laughs> and sometimes we can just cover things over with emotions and feelings and situations and opportunities. When it just comes down to the bare bones in it, that's the right thing to do, that's why I'm gonna do it. And that's what Boaz did. And what's so amazing is, is that what, what's motivating him to do the right thing is he really thinks that he's getting the better end of the deal. You're going to show me kindness? I'm some old washed up codger. That's what I am. You, you want to choose me? And Ruth, on the other hand, you know what she's saying? She's like, yeah, but there's nobody like you. There's nobody with your character. There's nobody with your standing. There's nobody with your righteousness. Both of these people think they're out kicking their coverage. That's why they want to do the right thing. And Ruth doesn't ask again to be covered. She just does what he says. She gets up in the morning, she takes the grain, and she goes home. Another truth that I think is really important for us to see this morning, we must find our security and identity in the Lord first and foremost. Now, Ruth says this proposal, spread your garments over me in verse 9. For you are a redeemer. What's interesting is the same words are used back in chapter two. Would you just go back to chapter two and look real quick? In verse 12, chapter two, verse 12. This is Boaz speaking to Ruth. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Ruth uses the same speaking to Boaz that Boaz used speaking to Ruth in chapter two. And what's this idea? Before Ruth ever sought security in a man, she found security in the Lord, the God of Israel first. You see that? We deal today with people who seek refuge in men and women As Ruth has sought protection and mercy in God's eyes, now she's doing that with Boaz. Y'all never reverse that order. We must never look for our security and identity in those we are attracted to or married to before we look to Christ because Christ alone is supreme. If you're single today, listen to me. Above all things, seek godly and Christ-like character above all else in a future spouse. Don't just go after anything. I, I joke at some of these student camps and I, and I say, you know, I will create a PDF for you. If some dude or some thing comes along and, and wants to date you and has intentions, I'll give you this PDF. It's called an application form. And it has a, it has a blank for name, full legal name. It has a blank for address. It has a, a blank for, uh, if, you, if you wish, social security number. We can run a background check. It has a place for last time I took a shower, last time I went to the dentist, what's my daily habits, what's my intentions for the relationship. And I tell these ladies, get that dude to submit it to you and tell him you'll get back with him for, in like 40 days. That usually chases off the riffraff. One time there was a, uh, a, a, a something came to a door and knocked on a door to talk to a teenage girl and the dad answered the, phone, uh, the door and he looked out and he said, what are you here to do? He said, I'm here to speak to your daughter. He said, no, you're not. 
He said, yeah, yeah, I'm here to speak to your daughter. He said, no, you're not. He said, why? He said, you can't. He said, why can't I speak to your daughter? He said, her mother went to the edge of death to bring her into this world. And, in, and since that moment, I have incurred all financial responsibility. And until something comes along with a little better potential, you're not speaking to my daughter. Shut the door. Girl comes down the stairs. Daddy, was that for me? Baby, no, that wasn't for you at all. <laughs> but you know why that happens? Because we're finding our identity and our security in people and not Christ first. Ladies, it is God who provides your protection. It is God who provides your security. It is God who provides your refuge. Too many women in our culture, in our society, are seeking refuge in a man and not Christ first. Husbands, you find your security and your identity in Christ alone. Your wife is to be served and to be led alone, but only after you follow Christ. Don't reverse that order. The man that, and the, the husband that loves Jesus first and follows Jesus first and seeks to please Jesus first will do a great service in serving his wife. I, I'm reading all this, y'all, because the Lord gave this to me the other morning on a walk, and if, if I don't like read it, I'll mess it up. The woman who delights and finds her joy in security in Jesus alone will find joy in her life and in her heart to love and serve and follow her husband. The reason why many of our marriages struggle, the reason why divorce is so rampant even in the church, and the reason why our society is producing the next generation of people who say, I love you only with the body and never with the heart of the soul and the will is because we seek our identity in people and not God. And if you've done that, can I tell you this morning, the gospel, Jesus can save, Jesus can restore, and even in this passage, Jesus can redeem from the worst of situations. So how do we do that? When my aim is to please Christ, and my allegiance is to please Christ, and my worship is to please Christ, most of the time, I will be able to love Lauren and serve Lauren and help Lauren. It is when the priority gets reversed and I please me and I focus on me that I neither please Christ or my wife. But you know what? It's amazing how when we get the vertical right, the horizontal works itself out. Through arguments sometimes, not arguments, intense moments of fellowship, right? That's how. <laughs> but isn't it true though? And that's what's happening here. She saw, this is a Moabite. She didn't even have a Bible. But you know what? This God of Israel, he's my refuge. He's my refuge. And that's why she was given a husband who did the same thing. So as we conclude this today, how, how does this passage point to Christ? Man, this is good, y'all. First, the, the lost come humbly to Christ's feet for mercy. Now, you know what's wild in this passage? And this is how we've missed it. I told you there's nothing scandalous, seductive, but commentators and theologians and some people have focused on the feet and the uncovering. And that's not the wild part of this passage. Whatever that might mean, totally, we, got a, we gave a pretty good shot at it today. But let me tell you what's even more wild. What's even more wild is that a woman, a servant, a Moabite, a foreigner would come to the feet of a master, an Israelite, and a man and say, do this for me, please. That's what's wild in the story. And why did she do that? Because in chapter two, she knew who he was because of the favor and kindness he had shown her. You know what this text is telling us? Is that sinners who have found brokenness and emptiness and just lostness in this world hear who the nail-pierced son of God is and they can boldly come to his feet and cast everything of themselves upon him because he is good. Because of his mercy, we come. Ruth is not telling Boaz what to do, to command him. Ruth is casting herself at Boaz's feet because she knows that only he can do this. And, and listen to me. She is asking Boaz to make a decision on her. For 50 years, for 100 years in American evangelicalism, we've been taught that 
poor little Jesus standing outside in the cold and the rain, the little nomad comes knocking on the throne of the door of our heart. Please let me in. Please let me in. Please let me in. That's not the way it is at all. He's not in need. We are. When someone's convicted of their sin and convinced of their lostness and convinced that all they deserve from God is wrath and hell, but in spite of that, he came down and he showed mercy and he absorbed all the wrath of God. What do you do? You fall at his feet saying, Lord, please show mercy to me. That's what Ruth's doing here. It's such a picture of Christ. Let me tell you, if you're outside of Christ this morning, come boldly to the throne of grace. All who come to me, Jesus said, I will by no means cast out. Call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins that sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. You can come boldly this morning and fall at Christ's feet because he is the greater Boaz and he always shows shows kindness to those who fall at his feet. Finally this morning, how does this text point to Christ? Christ is redeeming people from all nations as his bride. You know what's good, y'all? Ruabite. Uh, Ru- <laughs> Ruth ain't, ain't called a Moabite in chapter three, not once. She's not called a Moabite, not once, not once. Because a Moabite is not an ethnicity. A Moabite is who you worship in the heart. A Philistine is not an ethnicity. I'm, talking, I'm, I'm spiritually talking here. Don't think I'm denying the differences. But the way that scripture views it is that the Jew is not just the the Jew who's born in a certain tribe. The Jew is the one that has turned and given their heart alone to the God of Israel. That's why in the New Testament, us Gentiles, us grafted in Gentiles are, are called of the seed of Abraham because we worship Abraham's God. And what's amazing here is you see what's happening. The redemption's coming full circle. Ruth, as far as the narrator is concerned, is no longer a Moabite. Man, what a great picture. If there are any physical sons or daughters of Abraham this morning, you're in the minority as a physical Jew. Most of us just Gentiles. Our track record, we worship the sun and grasshoppers and everything moving and images and idols. And yet God so loved the world that he gave his son that through the blood of the lamb, he purchased men and women from God, from every tongue, every tribe, every language, every nation. And right now, all across this earth, God's people are gathering in local bodies like we are. And no matter what language they're singing and, and, and preaching in and speaking in, no matter what food they eat after the service, no matter what the color of their skin is, if there's more melanin, if there's less melanin, it doesn't matter. Same scripture, same God, same gospel, same Christ, same church. And why? Because God brings people from all nations. That's how this points to Christ. He's Boaz, we're Ruth. We've come to his feet, we've pled mercy, and guess what? He's taken us in. Friday morning at this camp we just finished up in in Foley. It's pretty cool when I get to do this. I got to Zoom an Indian pastor in, and he got to speak to the group. Technology is an amazing thing. This, this guy actually, those of you that went at 14, I, this was Raj. We, we piped Raj in. <clears throat> and he's sitting there. He's exhorting these students and sharing with them. Then he just starts talking about the, the burden that he has. Since the pandemic started, they've been trying to minister to people. And they've done some stuff over the last two months. They fed about 25,000 people at hospitals. And they recently saw this one village that they didn't really even, weren't even know about. And and kind of the main source of income was shut down several years back. And so in that village, even the teenage girls have to sell themselves in order to provide for families. And they, and they saw that and there was, there's nothing going on there. There's, there's no mission. Obviously there's no church. And, and so Starting this week, they, they've started targeting that place. And so I think they're going today or tomorrow to that place to begin to feed people and to begin to share the gospel with people. And these are people that are the lowest of the low, culturally. But they matter to God. And you see, when you've seen yourself as a Moabite, as a sinner, as someone who deserves nothing, 
But grace upon grace upon grace upon grace has been poured out through you through the gospel because all you were was a Moabite begging for forgiveness and he showed it, asking for mercy and he showed it undeserving of love, and yet he showed it. Undeserving of peace and forgiveness, and yet he shows it. You know what you'll say? I'll spend the rest of my life going after people that were just like me. Just like me. So as we go to prayer this morning, and as we worship, and as we get ready to go through this week, if, if you're outside of grace this morning, repent and believe the gospel. If you've been brought into grace this morning, who around you is in need of grace? Lift up your eyes. The fields are white to harvest. Let's pray. Lord, I'm thankful for the threshing floor. I'm thankful for a place of mercy an acceptance. A place where you promised to redeem us. A place where your redemptive plan comes true. Lord, I pray for those this morning, still may be in mourning, still may be in grief. Lord, would, would they this morning, by your grace, be able to lift their heads up and see the author and finisher of their faith to know that you're with them. Lord, some this morning continue, will we'll continue to walk, but, but Lord, some, some this morning may need to wash and perfume and put on new clothes because of your goodness. So God, I pray you'd give that victory this morning. God, I pray you'd deal with some of us that just aren't doing the right thing. Maybe it's direct sin. Maybe it's just unwise God, confront us this morning. Bring us, deliver us out of that for your glory and your sake. God, help us to find our, our fulfillment, our satisfaction in you alone so that we can be what we need to be to the people in our life. Oh God, your word and your spirit are so sufficient. Apply the word in our hearts. As we sit in prayer this morning in churches, we sit bowed and closed. What's the word said to your heart this morning? Perhaps you're in need of grace. You're lost without Jesus. Repent and believe the gospel this morning. This great God will receive you. That's the gospel. Just come with nothing and let him fix everything. Child of God, as the Lord deals with issues and Areas in your life, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins as we confess. The blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. He'll grant wisdom. Maybe you need to just sit and pray. I'll be on the front. Paul's here also. If you need to talk to someone, we'll be available after the service too. Whatever it is, let's be obedient to Jesus. Let's love him by obeying his word. Father, thank you for the scripture. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for the worship. Thank you that we can serve one another and encourage one another. We just ask that you would be glorified in our response and our obedience in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.